everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we will be speaking with Carrie Jenkins, CEO of Substantial. She'll be answering the question, are we building products that are ruining the world? Hi, Carrie. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, before we dive in a little bit about Carrie, Carrie is the CEO of Substantial, a digital innovation and build studio that partners with companies to create meaningful digital products. Carrie is passionate about the intersection of ethics and technology and deeply invested in fostering open dialogue about the influence of technology on our lives. She can play, or she also is deeply invested in the role digital innovation can play in solving some of society's greatest challenges. Uh, we would also love to know a little bit more about everybody who's tuning in. If you could go into the chat and drop in where you're tuning in from. You can also use this chat function to ask questions anytime throughout the presentation. Carrie will be sharing a presentation and we will have time for Q&A at the end. So go ahead and drop in questions at any time and we will answer as many as we can at the end. So without further ado, we will dive right in and Carrie, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks. So are we building products that are ruining the world? Um, if you came just to hear the answer to that question, I'll go ahead and get to it. And the answer is yes, but we don't have to. So technology is capable of making the world a better place, but we have to choose that. So I wanna start in a forest. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining me and just acknowledge that we're all on a lot of video calls right now. And so I really do appreciate you doing another one and, and being here with me. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I want to start in the forest, because uh, it, it's away from our computers and our heads, basically, and away from mute buttons and news feeds and homeschooling. And particularly in the last couple of weeks, it's been really eventful and emotionally draining. Uh, and so for me, I really like forests, not just because of all the usual metaphors, but I find them grounding and optimistic. So I want everybody to just take a second and and have a couple of deep breaths right here looking at this beautiful tree. And so if we were in this forest for real, this is the point at which most people would be bringing out their phones to take a picture of it. And on a video call, this is the point that most people would start to multitask. So I want you to resist that urge and to really be here with me in the forest for a second. And while we're here, I want to ask you to think about a digital product that you use, uh, a product that you use a lot. So this could be an app. This, it doesn't matter what platform it's on. It doesn't matter its purpose. I just want you to think about something you use that you really depend on. An app that you look forward to or that you really count on. Maybe you even take it for granted. And I want you to think about that like a product. How was that made? There was a team of people who created that product. What did success look like? for that team? What did they hope for their users, for you? We're going to come back to the forest a few times throughout this morning. And when we do, you'll know immediately that it means to breathe, <laughs> to take a step back and think about the product that you just had in your head. So I hope everybody has one, hold on to it because we're gonna think about it several more times as we go through the slides today. So I wanna talk a bit about the world we're in right now. This is my world, uh, this is substantial. So like most workplaces right now, it is empty. Um, so we're headquartered in Seattle and right now we're a fully remote and distributed workforce of so about 45 strategists and product managers and designers and developers. And so for 13 years, Substantial has been creating digital innovation and products for startups, for enterprises, and for foundations. We've created products with really large companies and really small ones, and occasionally we build products for ourselves. In the 20 years I've been in digital products, I've seen my fair share of questionable intentions 
and success metrics. I've been CEO for two years, but I've been using technology for decades. And I'm as conflicted as the next person about how and why I interact with technology and what's at stake and what's coming. And so today's talk is not about passing judgment. It's about fostering a sense of purpose that we can bring to every product we create. So I have a mission to have as many conversations as I can about the agency and responsibility we have to create products with intention. So today I'm gonna to spend a few minutes laying out the current environment products are built in and a few minutes talking about why what we create is so important. Then I'm gonna share a case study with you. And then we're gonna talk about how we can intentionally approach our work with integrity and ethics. So I wanna be clear about this because for a long time, people would say that technology is just a tool. Word processing is a tool. Word processing served through a platform that also provides your email and access to all the knowledge, news, resources and entertainment in the world while selling your data to advertisers is not a tool. It's an access point that is increasingly narrow and monopolized. It's not exactly the equivalent of a hammer. Hammers don't learn from us and then monetize how we strike the nail. Our access to fundamental information and services is increasingly through technology and often through products from just five major companies. We can no longer credibly opt out of technology. For most people, that's an option beyond their ability, like living without electricity or transportation. And consent is a fallacy. We are asking for explicit consent for implicit concepts. If it was your job to read privacy policies for eight hours per day, it would take you 76 work days to complete the task. And that's just reading them. Comprehending them is another story. Terms and conditions and privacy policies are about compliance, not ethics. The Center for Humane Technology, which I absolutely encourage you to visit and check out, has conducted reviews of peer-reviewed academic studies to create a holistic view of the negative impacts mobile tech and social media has on society. They call it a ledger of harms. And it covers things like the loss of ability to focus without distraction, loneliness, depression, stress, loss of sleep, and even increased risk of suicide. Less empathy, more confusion and misinterpretation, propaganda, lies, and an unreliable and noisy space to talk. Children facing new challenges, learning and socializes, so, socializing. And lastly, the fact that many people who work for tech companies, including CEOs, limit tech usage in their own homes. And this is a quote from a former VP of a major company, technology company, said that, I can't control my decision, which is that I don't use that crap. I can control my kids' decisions, which is that they're not allowed to use that crap. The short-term dopamine-driven dopamine feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. It's a good time to go back to the forest because it'd be easy to feel overwhelmed with all the negative aspects of technology. But let's return here and have a few breaths. And then I want you to think about that product again, the one, the digital product, the app that you use as you look at a forest. So what is it about a forest that succeeds? There's no clear example of an ecosystem that can be experienced. Everything is interrelated. The trees don't exist separately from the ground or the moss. They feed off each other. And it's the same thing with that product you're thinking about. A team somewhere designed and developed that product. How do you think they worked? What was most important to them? Do we care what kind of company creates our technology? Well, as it turns out, we do. And areas that are of increasing concern for people are data security, use of digital media for nefarious intent, 
workplace automation and a loss of jobs and a stark lack of diversity in technology companies, especially in leadership and policymaking positions. In 2015, 71% of Americans thought tech companies had a positive impact. That number is now 50% and still getting lower. My biggest concern is an industry culture that prioritizes speed above everything else while deprioritizing the lives of users in general and racial minorities in particular. So how might a rising unease with technology play out? Well, the first thing to realize is that your product is way more than just the sum of its features. Your users are taking into consideration far more than they did even five years ago. 87% trust your brand based on their experience as a product user. 56% trust your brand based on their experience as a customer. And almost 40% attribute trusting a brand based, to its, based on its impact to society. So right as technology is on the cusp of breakthroughs in some of the world's biggest challenges, trust is declining. We're in the middle of a climate crisis, a global health pandemic, and unprecedented social unrest. Digital technology has been integral in keeping businesses running and vital information flowing, and it can be critical in problem solving. But widespread negative sentiment towards tech companies is obviously going to make adoption and trust more challenging. Would you believe that Black Lives Matter to a company that makes a large amount of revenue from white supremacist content? Can the largest companies in the world lead on climate change when their business still relies on contracts from fossil fuel companies? Should you trust that technology companies will prioritize your privacy when using a contact tracing app when those same companies have violated your privacy and service of their platforms? Every contradiction, every misstep builds in people's consciousness. Imagine trying to encourage voting digitally after what happened in the Iowa caucuses. Back to the forest. <laughs> That's a lot. One deep breath. And then we're going to think about your product again, the one you love, the one you use. And we're going to specifically think about the people that created it. Think about the team that it took to get that product done. How did they generate ideas and make decisions? Maybe there was a whiteboard and some stickies, or maybe there were business cases and specification meetings. Do you think there was a woman on that team? Or a black person? Or someone with disabilities? Someone who didn't go to college or came from an economically challenged background. I want to tell you a story. So Acme Health Tech is a startup that's made a name for itself by tapping into the enormous demand for digital health information, particularly health records. They have a free platform that allows physicians to document patient visits, order prescriptions and lab tests, and easily access their records online. Now, Acme had experimented with other revenue models, but research-oriented businesses take years to develop. And in the meantime, pharma advertising is a huge pool of spend, and it's a more straightforward sales opportunity. In 2016, drug makers spent almost $20 billion advertising to physicians and other prescribers. But once you choose an ad-driven path, Commercial gravity tugs in the direction of selling more ad inventory and creating more effective advertising tools. And Acme had a lot of really big mouths to feed. So they had an idea. They had access to tons of insightful information. What if they offered that up to their advertisers? advertisers, especially pharmaceutical companies that had never had access to granular weekly data on their drugs. So they decided to use something called clinical decision support. And it, that's not new. That's been applied in many, many ways through healthcare. 
Clinical decision support is any tool that provides treatment information targeted to a specific person or situation. And they used it before in vaccinations. So previously, Acme had worked with a pharma company to develop workflow tools based on CDC guidelines that would boost vaccinations in the elderly, particularly for pneumonia. And that work was viewed really positively. So why not apply it to other uses? So partnering with a different pharma company, they started with a research study to see what kind of CDS would work with patients suffering from chronic pain. The idea was to get the opioid makers pain drugs to certain kinds of patients, ones who weren't taking opioids or those being prescribed the company's less profitable products. It also aimed to secure longer prescriptions. Some of the things from that study include the acknowledgement that overuse of medication and pain treatment was a national issue at the time. One of the conclusions was that reminders may have a sustained influence on the rate of opioid prescribing. So they created a product experience based on those findings. Click a button and the program would create a treatment plan. So after a pop-up asked for a patient's level of pain, a drop-down menu then lists treatments from referrals to a prescription for an opioid. And despite the suggestions looking like unbiased medical information, ACME allowed the pharmaceutical companies to participate in designing the alerts, including selecting the guidelines used to develop the alerts, setting the criteria that would determine when a healthcare writer received an alert, and in some cases, even drafting the language used in the alert itself. The drug maker paid Acme almost a million dollars for this product. From 2016 to spring 2019, the alert went off 230 million times. It's difficult to even imagine the internal decision cycle that approved the work without triggering ethical or legal alarm bells. In a business of this size, perhaps a $1 million deal might not have been discussed at the board level, but 14 of them most certainly would. So I want you to think about how many leaders, how many managers, how many analysts, researchers, consultants, designers, and developers worked on this product. Imagine all of the meetings and how many of those meetings were the objectives, intent, and success metrics discussed? Really good time to go back to the forest and take a breath. And let's think about your product, the one you love and use. Presumably it's a positive part of your life, however small, but what's the ecosystem your product lives in? Who and what are the other actors in that system? Because for every Acme Health Tech, there is a technology company putting out products that are positive additions to our lives. And I think we can make more of those. So it's worth mentioning that the employees of Acme Health Tech seem just like you and me. I don't get the sense they chose worsening opioid addiction as their career path. From what I can tell, their design team seemed somewhat diverse and close-knit and focused on quality design practices. Their design principles, while this product was being created and deployed, were published on their website as three words. Simple, focused, trusted. Design is not a field which is immune from doing harm. And placing the burden of ethical choices on one department or role or on a process ignores the realities of the decisions, big and small, that happen outside of design. We shouldn't expect products to be inherently ethically designed just because we put them through a process. Design is a skill and an approach, and it can be employed for any purpose. Remember, most designer and design departments still report into the business. 
And if you're thinking regulatory progress and legal requirements are going to solve ethical friction, know that compliance and ethics are not the same thing. Compliance is a minimum bar for social responsibility, but it's also mostly about risk mitigation. Ethics is not as black and white. It's about how you contribute, influence, and lead. Acting ethically takes courage. Ethical individuals often find themselves as a party of one. This is why ethical mishaps are thornier and frankly more damaging. They can happen in such tiny steps that we don't even know we're moving into the line we crossed is miles behind us. An integrity framework is broader, deeper, and more demanding than a legal compliance initiative. It doesn't replace design thinking or compliance. What I'm proposing is a set of questions that we are ready to answer even when they're hard. Questions we ask ourselves from the leadership level all the way down to an individual contributor. And when we get the answers to those questions, we commit to the hard work it takes to make better choices. And some of these ideas are big and structural, and you may think you don't have that kind of power. But asking the questions and everyone acknowledging the answer, even if it isn't what you want to hear, gives you power. And it's the only way to make progress. So here is step one, lead from why. If the leaders in the company don't set a very clear example of what's important, teams will make their own assumptions. Maybe you think you are a leader, but if you are here, you can lead. So what does successful engagement mean in your product? And how are you serving your users? Are you engaging in open dialogue and critical thinking? How do you define success? And does it factor in humanity, community, and society? You model a willingness to listen to criticism, a willingness to admit and take responsibility for ethical mistakes, a willingness to ask forgiveness and take corrective action. Could you disclose your intentions openly to your teams and customers and users? Two is to change the operating system products are being built in. This isn't about the platform products live on. This is about the actual environment with which products are created. Are directives and mandates coming from above without discussion or involvement at every level? Is enough time being spent centering on those objectives to ensure good decision-making? Who has an obligation to dissent? What is the message being sent from the incentives in your company? Is a large percentage of compensation in equity? Are people bonus for hitting only revenue or profits? The result is going to be a bias towards shortcuts, speed, status quo, and poorly thought out implications. What kind of accountability is framed in your org structure? Is it an extremely competitive atmosphere with huge growth and high turnover, constant reorgs and leadership changes. We may be telling ourselves that the meritocracy will serve us, but it has proven not particularly adept at ethical behavior. Teams that work in silos have a much harder time connecting to the intention of their work. If there are competing priorities or a competition for resources, a very clear response would be to value only objectives without factoring in the larger holistic picture. Three, reduce blind spots. And believe me, you have them. Diversity in and of itself will not guarantee ethical products but it is very hard to create them without diversity. Our homogenous teams give us confidence in our biases and apathy towards our blind spots. And this isn't just about representation. Think about the cultural norms that may be inhibiting more diversity. I can tell you I'm a female CEO with a very diverse executive team and my company still struggles with inclusivity and diversity. So how are your meetings run? What does collaboration really look like? 
Who are your dominant speakers? Which points of view are championed? Debate and discussion foster ethical learning. Almost all ethical learning happens when people discuss and debate their values. And when competing priorities arise, it's our ethics that guide decision-making. It's not a coincidence that many of the largest tech companies have had a high rate of harassment and troubling behavior, and many of those same, same companies have created ethically questionable strategies and products. Low diversity of employees limits psychological safety for anyone not in the majority, which means any employees that may have alternative points of view likely feel like they can't express them. And the moral muteness of many managers and employees prevents ethical learning. Four, think in systems. Remember the forest. Products are not isolated. They are part of an ecosystem along with intended users and other actors. Do you fully understand that system? Assume it's complex, because I assure you it probably is, and map it out. What is the key to that system? The entity whose existence all other actors depend. If we think back to the Acme Health Tech product, the key was prescribers. So any expectations of speed, scale, and adoption can cause imbalances and unexpected consequences. Does your product improve the system, change it, or eliminate parts of it? The Acme Health Tech product changed the way prescribers made decisions and improved speed to decisions. but it also made the quality of the doctor's decisions worse, and it deprived the patients of an opportunity for different kinds of care and tipped the scales even further in addiction to painkillers. You have to think about how your product can change the system in unattended ways. What would happen if the key to that system, to the Acme Health Tech product system, had actually been the patients instead of the prescribers? And last, create with foresight. Once you understand the system, you can start to map out how it might evolve. And this isn't an empty exercise. This is part of building a product in a landscape that changes rapidly. What are the trends affecting the system locally and globally? The politics, the demographics, the emerging technology. What does the system look like in year one, year three, your five and beyond. And I wanna be clear, this is not a roadmap of the features of your product. This is about the system it lives in. What other actors might be introduced? What actors might fall away? Does the key change? Once you can look forward in that way, how does your product still fit? And how will it succeed? And finally, it is vastly important to mention how many good ideas are diluted or abandoned because they just can't generate revenue fast enough. When you think about what success looks like, know that every milestone can have a profound effect on the quality of innovation. This is true for large businesses and small investors or not. If speed really is the most important metric, what are you sacrificing for it? The culture of your company and organization and each and every team within it will determine their output. It doesn't mean that good products haven't been built in bad environments, but there was a cost to that. That cost was either to the product builders or it was to the users, but someone paid. So we're back to our forest. We're breathing and we're thinking about the positive things that technology can do if we commit to thinking about our intentions and our responsibility differently. 
Because with strategic foresight and a willingness to learn, to listen, to act, we can create products that contribute positively to our world. So it may help to think of that framework as a mindset that gently lays across your organization like a moss blanket. It's providing nutrients and warmth and moisture. Or maybe you wanna think about it as an ethical compass guiding you through the trees. Or maybe you're tired of the forest, which is okay because we're done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was great. Uh, the calming forest really did help when things got a little heavy there. For sure. It's heavy times. Yeah, but I loved your optimism during all of this too. There are definitely issues that need to be faced, but you are so optimistic in the way that you are challenging those. So just to kind of kick things off, I know you have a lot of experience in the industry. I would love to know a little bit more about what first made you so passionate about ethics and technology. Uh, well, it's something I've certainly thought about um, in the last five years in particular, as I think lots of large scale sort of ethical quandaries uh, have been brought to the, the public's attention. Things like data privacy come to mind. Certainly our election security comes to mind. And so it was, it was top of mind because I work in a technology company. But when I became CEO, I became uh, much more committed to the responsibility I have to talk about it. Because I think for a while, it, it really wasn't talked about enough, mostly because I think we wanted to believe as technologists that it was happening over there. <laughs> that those kinds of problems are really only relevant to products that have the scale of some of these giant technology platforms. And I think it's really important for us to think about every single product, because if you have one user or a billion users, that product's intention is still to serve that user. And I really wanted to ensure that we were having these conversations in smaller rooms with smaller companies um, and that we started to have, you know, say the, say the thing. That's a sort of a personal motto I have, which is that there's something going unsaid in almost every meeting room and every uh, conversation. And I think with respect and, and sort of a constructive intention, we should, we should talk about those things. And in, in technology, a lot of it is around monetization and uh, the strategies we use for engagement. Um, that we, you know, are learning more and more can have real psychological implications on our users. Yeah, and I loved what you said there too, just keeping that conversation open. And during your presentation, you talked about reducing blind spots, which is obviously very top of mind for everyone right now, especially with all of the things that are going on in society at the moment. Um, very curious about how Substantial opens up those conversations, either internally or while you're working on products and what role diversity and inclusion is playing in your ethical innovation. That's a, it's a great question. And obviously it is incredibly relevant to everyone right now, though it should be relevant at all times. Um, so I will, I will say two things that are true. The first one is that Diversity, in my opinion, is probably the most important thing we can be doing in building products. Ensuring that the teams um, from the leadership down to individual contributors are not a homogenous group and represent um, marginalized communities and underrepresented communities is the most important thing I think that companies can be thinking about. That's the first thing I'll say. And the second thing I'll say is that Substantial is failing in this. Um, and I admit that. we are not making progress fast enough in diversifying our workforce. Um, you know, technology and particularly West Coast technology companies have a reputation for being um, majority white, majority white male. Um, and, you know, we certainly have made progress at Substantial. And as I said in the presentation, as a female CEO and having a really diverse executive team, I'm proud of that fact, but it has not solved the problem for us. Uh, last year, we started a intentional diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiative at the company and brought outside consultants in to help us. Um, and the truth of the matter is that, you know, as hard as we're working and as many difficult conversations as we're having, it's not fast enough. 
Um, and we're not, we're not seeing results that I, I'm really proud of at this point as far as actual hiring metrics. So I know how hard this is. Um, I, I don't say diversity is important because I think it's easy, um, but I do think it's something we have to commit to and not just when the news cycle is as you know, um, urgent as it feels right now. Because I'll tell you something, diversity takes, um, and inclusivity for that matter, takes time and real commitment. So one or two, you know, sort of small initiatives is not gonna get you there. It takes, you know, every part of the company working towards it. And um, it takes real commitment and it takes resources. For us, it, it absolutely took outside help as well, which, you know, I highly recommend. It's very hard sometimes looking within your own company, particularly if you already have a majority white company with a lot of white cultural norms to be able to do this work on your own. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And I mean, asking for outside help is always the first step and totally agree that it's a it's an ongoing conversation. And kind of piggybacking on that too, is there a current ethical issue in the tech space that you don't feel is getting enough attention? Yeah, I actually think uh, it's one of the reasons why I spend quite a bit of time on it in the presentation. I think the environment that technology is getting created in is really problematic. And so certainly one aspect of that is the lack of diversity. But I think the, um, the success at all costs, the growth at all costs, particularly um, those companies that are investment backed um, or that are considering going public, right? We, we don't really acknowledge, I think enough, what that kind of environment um, fosters in the creators of products. If growth and scale is really all you care about, then you need to acknowledge the trade-offs that are happening in service of that. And individual contributors who are incentivized for, you know, by only hitting revenue metrics, time to market metrics, right? That means they're sacrificing other things to get to that point. And so we've had that sort of um, umbrella living over, particularly in Silicon Valley, you know, product builders for, you know, decades now. And it has permeated <laughs> the culture of building products. It has permeated what innovation looks like. It has permeated what we believe success looks like. And I think it's been, I think it's been really damaging. Um, and that, that's a very easy thing to say on one side, because I think the, the real challenge is that people need to make, you know, need to make revenue so their businesses can survive. So I don't want to uh, not acknowledge that. I absolutely understand the imperative um, to be revenue positive. But I think that the investment culture has, um, has also put some pressure on businesses to make trade-offs um, that really sacrifice what their users should be getting from those products. Yeah, during your presentation, I was thinking about when you were talking about trust, how it's so popular for companies to talk about how they're customer obsessed, but they don't often talk about how they're serving their customers. So I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about trust and how uh, people who are building products can work to earn the trust of their customers. Well, I think, you know, I agree with you. Everyone says they're customer focused. And I think you could, you could absolutely say that Acme Health Tech was customer focused. They were 100% dedicated uh, to their customer. But I think what people didn't understand is who their customer was. People thought their customer were the doctors, but their customers were actually the pharmaceutical companies. And this is a big problem with, with large platforms, particularly those that are advertising based, is that who their customer is gets really confusing. Is it the advertisers or is it the users of the platform? So first and foremost, I think building trust is about a level of transparency about your monetization um, because we have been used to now for again, decades, getting technology served to us for free, right? We are used to not paying for our email clients. We're used to not paying for um, our search engines, but we haven't stopped to think about how those companies are the, the largest companies in the world, right? How they're monetizing. I think there's a lot of increased intention, you know, attention on that, but 
companies that are making money off of uh, the data that they have access to is you know, the basis for many, many, many businesses. And I don't think people understand that. So some transparency around how you make money, I think is really, really important for building trust. Um, and I, I think the way you handle um, your, your products sort of life cycle with its users, the evolution of your product is also really, really important. Products typically go out with what's called, you know, an MVP, they go out with a smaller set of features to learn from their user base as they are going to develop the rest of the product and, and figure out where it's going to evolve to. And we don't always communicate those pivots very well to the user base, right? So you might go out with a product that has one intention and, and then years later you realize that another intention actually serves your business better. But we're not very good about explaining to the users what that means. So transparency, I think, is a big part of it. A transparency, too, that is explainable. So this is a big problem with the way we are transparent now with terms and conditions and privacy policies. They don't make sense to people. Um, they're far too full of legalese. So if you're going to be transparent and build trust, I think you have to talk to your users in a way that they can understand and be really clear about what your product is bringing to them and what the exchange for that is. Yeah, definitely no one is reading all of those terms and conditions when they're signing up for anything. Before we wrap up, I do want to make sure I get to one of our audience questions. Um, looking at this a little bit more on the user side, uh, we have a question asking, what principles do you use to guide the use of technology in your own life? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I wish I had a great answer here uh, because I'm... I'm flailing about like most parents. I have a, a six, almost seven year old daughter. Um, and she is, you know, obviously completely enamored with screens like most kids her age. So what we try to do is have a limited subset with which she can make her own choices. So we may choose a few apps that we feel like are um, good experiences for her, not just learning apps too. She has entertainment apps that she has access to for certain times of the day. And then we might choose um, which uh, shows or movies she's allowed to watch, but then we allow her the choice between those choices, right? So we create sort of a safer subset because I wanna encourage in her the ability to make some of her own choices um, and, I've found that the more we limit her to say things we only feel are educational or we only feel are learning related, um, the more she, you know, um, rebels against that. So if we give her a subset of content and, and apps and then let her make some choices, I feel like we're supporting her agency to choose wisely. And she doesn't always choose wisely. There's definitely some movies that I, you know, <laughs> like, why are you watching this? Uh, not because they're dangerous, they're children's movies, but just because they're not high quality. Um, but I think it's important for her to understand the difference. And, you know, at her age, um, we're trying to sort of give her more choices than, uh, we did say when she was like four. For myself, you know, it's very hard to not be addicted to technology in the job that I work on. I am sort of um, a Twitter addict. I don't participate. I just scroll. <laughs> um, so every once in a while, I have to just go cold turkey. And um, it's always, you know, a really big breath of fresh air. It's like visiting the forest um, when I put that down. And, and then for me, you know, my um, I, you know, I'm not on many social media platforms. Um, I just sort of don't really engage in that way anymore, mostly for uh, prioritization reasons. I sort of prioritize where I want to spend my time and then I put the, the rest of it aside. Yeah, I know how easy it is to get sucked into hours of social media. You get your <laughs> from your iPhone and it's terrifying. Yeah. And, you know, part of me feels like it really is part of my job to stay really informed on current events and trends. You know, I talked about that in the presentation, understanding the ecosystem that products live in requires you to think outside of the, the tiny circle that your product is in. Well, if you consider substantial, my, you know, the company I run, my product, I've got a big ecosystem around it. So I take that responsibility seriously, but I also, you know, need to let go of my newsfeed every once in a while. And just like everybody else, I have a hard time doing that. Take a step back and visit the forest. <laughs> visit the forest. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, it does look like we're out of time. Um, Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great to speak with you and to hear more about what you're doing at Substantial. To everyone on the line, um, we will be following up with the video after this recording. It will be sent to you via email. You'll also be able to find that on our YouTube channel and on our blog. So Carrie, thank you so much for joining and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.